Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert. You're watching a special edition of The Listening Post on a new kind of reporting, open source journalism. Citizen journalism allows anybody with a mobile phone to document a news story, to produce content that is now routinely used by news organizations. Open source journalists often start with that kind of material and then they apply some of the same investigative techniques that are used by police and intelligence agencies. This is a growth industry, partly because of declining press freedom in some hostile places. In China, for instance, open source researchers have proven the existence and the location of so-called re-education camps for Muslims in the province of Xinjiang. And they broke those stories long before mainstream media outlets did. Open source reporters have also proved valuable on the story in Syria, where at least 10 media workers were killed in 2018. And they did so without having to go there and take the risks that come with that assignment. We've had two producers working on the story of open source journalism, Tarek Nafa and Daniel Turi. Daniel, you've looked at how open source research has shed light on the camps in Xinjiang. We'll see that report a bit later on. But briefly, what have you learned? Well, for a long time, Richard, Chinese officials were actually flat out denying that these camps even existed. And at the same time, the government was doing its best to make sure that journalists on the ground in Xinjiang didn't find them. And that's where open source researchers made their mark. It was the evidence that they uncovered, which ultimately gave the lie to those denials that had been coming out of Beijing. Tarek, your report on Syria will be coming up first. That war has been described as the world's first YouTube conflict, and it's produced a gold mine of material for these kinds of researchers. Absolutely, because so many people have been documenting that war, or at least trying to. Consider this. It's estimated that there are more hours of footage of this war than there are actual hours of the war in real life. And all those images and information we've been saturated with is raw material for open source researchers. But to understand what's really going on in Syria, all of that media needs to be analysed, interpreted and authenticated. And that's what the two investigators I interviewed for this piece, Hadi Al-Khatib and E.R. Wiseman, are doing in different ways, in different countries, on the same story. It is the most documented war in history producing millions of images and videos that shape how we see the carnage inflicted on Syria. A conflict that has been open season on civilians, humanitarian workers and reporters. Where even atrocities are open to subjective interpretation and control of information is used as a weapon. Where the age-old fog of war is not just a byproduct, but arrived at by design. When an incident occurs today, immediately smartphones are switching on, sometimes dozens, or even hundreds uh, of videos around a single incident. Where are those people filming? What can we see in their images? How can we make sense of all this material that uh, otherwise seem completely chaotic? When it comes to Syria, there is more a tendency on depending on um, user-generated contents, uh, videos, photos, because of the inaccessibility and the security situation that journalists, human rights organizations, and news agencies face. What open source research uh, give is information that could be verified in order to understand more incidents of human rights violations. From a compact office in suburban Berlin, Hadi Al-Khatib is building an archive of Syria's revolution and subsequent war. His Syrian archive is a huge database, more than two million videos, more than 5,000 sources. Utilizing open source tools like Google Earth, Khatib's team pinpoints the exact site of an attack using geographical landmarks, a practice known as geolocation. That location is then corroborated with satellite imagery. You've documented more than 200 different chemical weapons attacks. So how does that work then? So we've collected 860 videos about the use of illegal munitions, chemical attacks, and those were collected from 190 sources. Photos and videos that were published by uh, either humanitarian groups that are working in Syria or rescue groups or just normal citizens that were uh, documenting the incidents and publishing that on social media. And we placed it on a map like this. Here we can see this cylinder has been used uh, to drop 
uh, in uh, residential areas and it contains chlorine. We are able to see also like the impact sites uh, of where this incident happened. Uh, in this case, it happened in the uh, in a hospital called uh, Latamna, the surgical hospital of, uh, of Latamna. The Syrian archive takes the raw material produced from Syria's war, the millions of hours of footage, and tries to get to the truth behind some of the most contentious episodes in this conflict. Berlin, however, is just one location where open sources are being used to try and understand what's happening inside Syria. In London, a group of researchers are using some of the same techniques personal testimony, investigative journalism, and they've combined it with what's known as spatial modeling to reconstruct the stories behind some of the atrocities that have been committed in Syria. So imagine you find online 56 videos of an incident. Uh, all of them are shaky. Uh, you don't know exactly where they are filming from and what is being captured in the videos. And we figured out that by building architectural models, we can actually locate each one of those video sources and see the relationship between them. And as you can see... A.R. Wiseman is an architect by trade. He's also the founding director of Forensic Architecture. For us, the architectural model is like an optical device. And we can navigate from one point of view to the other and understand what it is that we see and understand also, very importantly, what cannot be seen in those videos. There are some places cameras cannot go. Forensic architecture has used a different kind of open source, human ones, to reconstruct a notorious Syrian prison, said Naya. Thousands of Syrians have been imprisoned and killed there. Amnesty International calls it an architectural instrument of torture. By tapping into the experiences etched into the memories of the few who've escaped, forensic architecture has been able to build a model of a prison that, for reporters, is impenetrable. So Naya is like a black hole. There is no photographs, there are no videos. The only evidence that you have for what happened in Sadnaya is the memory of those detainees. And they have endured the worst kinds of torture, deprivation, hunger, and conditions that are uh, inhumane to the extreme. Together with Amnesty, uh, we met five survivors of the Sadnaya prison. We built the model of the prison starting from what was in front of them, starting from the floor tiles. <laughs> And measuring the floor tiles, we figured out how big the room was. And out of the floor tile, the room, the corridor, we figured out the architecture of the building. And for the first time, we have recreated the model of how this place looks like, how it operates, how torture uh, was enacted there. One of the unique things that you use is acoustic modeling. Can you tell us a little bit about what it allows you to find out about the prison? So effectively, prisoners were led in uh, blindfolded and they could remember the building through the sound, through its acoustic characteristics. I Number of doors opening and closing. Footsteps in the corridor coming in to take out those condemned to death to the place of execution. So this is a sophisticated sound software that allows you to model the building not only as to what you'd see, but to what you'd hear in it. April 2018, one of the most contentious stories of the conflict, the chemical weapons attack on Duma. Итак, американские журналисты не нашли в сирийском городе Дума свидетельств химической атаки. It produced as many narratives as this war has actors. All of a sudden, some gas spread around us, this neighbor recounted. We couldn't breathe. Russian news channels took the lead, casting the atrocity as a false flag attack, staged by the Syrian Civil Defense, also known as the White Helmets. 
Вот он, тот самый баллон, якобы использовавшийся во время химатаки, лежит совершенно целый. И это главное не состыковка, ведь... There are accusations that activists may have tampered with the scene of the attack for dramatic effect. However, internet detectives also revealed that Russian news interviews with this boy, used as evidence that the attack was staged, was actually filmed at a Syrian army facility in Damascus, in the presence of Russian military advisors. The story was then amplified in some poorly sourced Western journalism and left to fester in the darker, more conspiratorial corners of the internet. Duma was a case study in confusion, the manufactured kind. And open source researchers working from a distance may have brought us closer to the truth. Immediately after the, the yellow canisters hit a balcony in a room uh, in Duma, uh, images of those canisters start appearing online. The next day, the Syrian military is there, and the only news channels that are being brought in are Russian news channels who start filming that area and claiming that the entire attack has been staged. So the forensic problem was rather simple. Did those canisters come from the air? We know that the air was exclusively controlled by the Syrian Air Force and the Russians. Uh, or from the ground? I, did the rebels place it? We're working here like archaeologists, but archaeologists that have no access to materiality, only to the media, and from the media building the closest possible proximity to the object of the canister. So we could measure all its deformation that pointed to us to the fact that the canister is actually being dropped from the air because only a force of a drop could actually create such bumps at the front part of the canister and untangling all this twisted metal that we saw at the background of the images helpfully provided to us by the Russian media, uh, who didn't know that in that mess there is actually quite useful information. Taking a skeptical approach to war reporting is not only healthy, but necessary. History has taught us that. And while much skepticism is directed primarily at governments with their agendas and track records of producing propaganda, the work of reporters and open source researchers like Wiseman and Khatib also comes in for critique. They've been questioned on their qualifications, their methods and their motives. I think we need to be always tuned to criticism of our work. However, there's a difference between criticism and denial. And especially in the field of Syria, there are people whose work is more to obfuscate and in fact politically motivated attacks on the very fact and possibility of verification. Well, worked, all of these journalists, media activists who were trained in Turkey and then infiltrated back into Syria to produce the propaganda, and that includes the White Helmet. And this is part of our post-truth environment. And I think the answer to this need to be in the meticulous, systematic way in which we work, in showing how it is that we arrive at our conclusions. And in fact, most of our analysis is showing how we know what we know. If you look at our videos, it's mainly methodology. As long as people risk their lives to post videos online, we will be there to look at what we're doing is writing the history of that conflict. And at some point in the future, not now, we'll be able also to call to justice and accountability those responsible. The International Criminal Courts have used for the first time in history uh, social media materials published on, on Facebook in order to issue a warrant of arrest against war criminals in Libya. For us in Syria, this is a huge milestone. Our work is focused on making sure that this material is preserved for the next 30 years and more. The material shows lots of things. In some cases, it shows the perpetrators that were responsible for these attacks. It shows the buildings and hospitals and schools and, and bakeries that were targeted. Uh, in order to force uh, people to, to migrate. Uh, that's why this archive is really important for the future of Syria. This is why we keep doing this work. Allah 
And as we heard there, archiving the war, the revolution, is about so much more than just telling Syria's story right now. It's about collecting the evidence upon which this conflict's history will be written. OK, thanks, Tarek. Daniel, your report on open source research of the Xinjiang story in China. How does the work there compare to what we've just seen on Syria? The main difference is in the method. In the case of Xinjiang, researchers have relied mostly on official documents as opposed to video as investigators in Syria have. Before the re-education camps became the global story they are now, Chinese officials had been putting government tenders online. We're talking here about potential contracts for private companies to build and staff the camps. A couple of researchers, Adrian Zenz, a German academic who I interviewed in Stuttgart, and Sean Zhang, who's a Chinese student based in Canada, they found the documents. And before long, they were using Google Earth to actually locate, photograph, and provide evidence for hundreds of Xinjiang's camps. In the most heavily surveilled province of one of the most surveilled countries on Earth, almost every movement is monitored, whether you're a local or a journalist on assignment. The first thing you notice is the extreme level of police presence. On every intersection, on every block, there is uh, often a multi-story police building. There are security checks everywhere. And if you add to that the fact that there are also surveillance cameras on every street corner kitted out with facial recognition technology, then you very quickly get to feel the sense of being surveilled, of being watched wherever you are. According to a report published by the Foreign Correspondents Club of China last year, nine in every ten foreign journalists working in Xinjiang spoke of interference from the authorities. Some were detained by police, others forced to delete data on their phones and other devices. Almost all the reporters, 96%, say they were visibly followed. Then there are the far graver dangers that face local sources. In 2018, journalist James Palmer, formerly based in China, spoke about his personal experience trying to cover Xinjiang. All of my Uyghur sources are gone. Sorry. I can't talk to people because they're gone. I cannot reach them. When we look at the lists of reasons that have been given for people to be sent to concentration camps, having had contact with foreigners is the single most dominant reason. I have certainty of one of my sources being sent to a camp. With the others, I don't know whether they've um, just cut off contact for their own safety or whether they're actually imprisoned. I stopped trying to reach Uyghur sources uh, in the, about the middle of last year because the risk to them was much greater um, than any possible benefit of talking to them. For its part, China says there is no such thing as so-called re-education camps in Xinjiang. A growing body of evidence suggests otherwise. With reporting inside Xinjiang stunted by surveillance and intimidation, news outlets have relied heavily on outside help to cover the camps. Researchers have now identified and mapped nearly 100 suspected re-education camps and detention facilities across Xinjiang. Much of the media reporting is the result of investigations done from a distance. Independent researchers using the simplest of open source methods, for instance the Chinese search engine Baidu, had struck digital gold. A trove of official documents detailing China's mass incarceration program. Making sense of these documents requires a specific skill set. For a start, you need to be fluent not just in Mandarin, but in the jargon of Chinese officials. You also need to know what to look for. Adrian Zenz is a German academic, and he's one of the pioneers of open source research about the camps in Xinjiang. In early 2018, he began annotating the documents and republishing them online. So you're one of the first researchers to use open source methods to investigate these camps in Xinjiang. What made you think that you would succeed using these tools where conventional journalists had failed? The big advantage of this open source research is that you can uncover documents that speak of systematic policy, where the government itself says, we're doing this 
and every local government under us is also supposed to be doing this. And oftentimes I was able to find this kind of document. What's this particular document? So this is the uh, main supposed uh, legal foundation for re-education. So when the Chinese say we have established the extremification centers based on the law, this is the document they refer to. Another document that I found talks about the goals of transformation through education. It even very blatantly says that transformation through education in Chinese Jiao Yu Zhuanhua cleanses the brain from evil thoughts or from the thoughts of religion. That's a piece of evidence that speaks as much or more than a hundred newspaper articles because it basically proves that this is a systematic policy. The documents that Zenz uncovered were evidence of state policy, but proving the camps had actually been built, enough of them to hold hundreds of thousands of people, required another open source tool, satellite imagery. That's where Sean Zhang, a Chinese student based in Vancouver, came into the picture. I started by searching a few keywords online and found lots of information such as government tender notices for the camps to be built. These documents contain the addresses of nearly a hundred camps. So I searched on Google Earth and found the satellite images. They look very different from civilian facilities. For example, there were barbed wire fences. There were watchtowers, structures that you'd expect in prisons. I found more and more information and so published it on my blog. Satellite imagery and information collected by a researcher in Canada indicate that the camp has recently undergone major construction. Just Documents like found by Mr. Zenz mention psychological counselling for the children of parents taken to the camps. A lot of mainstream media's coverage has built upon Adrian or Sean's work. You've seen Adrian's using government documents and hiring information to show the extent to which the security state has grown in Xinjiang. And Sean has used satellite imagery to show the camps being built almost in real time. In the Financial Times, we've also used satellite imagery to look at the location and size of the camps. We've also used research by Adrian Zenz on the contracts that governments are using to buy new materials for the camps. And I think the really important thing about these kinds of research collaborations is that because the data is open, the journalists can also check what the researcher is looking at. And if needed, you know, challenge whether the data they're seeing is representative of the region or how the data was chosen. Communist Party officials, not usually known for their transparency, gave open source researchers a helping hand by leaving the evidence in plain sight. Now, Beijing is in damage limitation mode, trying to delete documents before investigators in Stuttgart, Vancouver and elsewhere archive and repost them. An online game of cat and mouse over one of the world's biggest stories. The set of documents that disappeared basically described the details of the camps, the security features, barbed wire, watchtowers, how big they are and what they cost. A lot of that disappeared. And so we were feverishly starting to archive websites and spent almost entire days on archiving hundreds of links. But I think in some sense, they pulled it too late. We, we already had the information. By staying one step ahead of Beijing, open source researchers unearthed evidence about the camps that journalists on the ground in Xinjiang could not. But going up against a superpower, magnifying scrutiny of an already notorious human rights record, comes with consequences. All the more so, in this case, if you're a Chinese citizen. Since I started my research, I felt a lot of pressure from the Chinese government. For example, they've contacted my family in China. So in the near future, I think I will avoid going back home. Despite all this, I think doing this work is worth it because there are so many Uyghur people detained. They've lost contact with their families. At least my research can raise awareness of this problem and help pressure the Chinese government into finding a peaceful solution. And even if the Chinese authorities are successful in shutting down an individual like Sean Zhang, there are more open source researchers like him out there. 
And that's Beijing's challenge on this story, as it is for the Assad government in Damascus. It's not the reporters doing this kind of work. It's the technology that makes this kind of work possible. And that's a much more difficult, if not impossible, thing to suppress. You've been watching a special edition of our program on open source journalism. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.